Hello and welcome back to this Downplay Dualistic Crusade. In this video, I'll be discussing and reviewing Indicator's beautiful first volume in their Columbia Noir box set series. Now, unfortunately, this volume and uh, volume two, uh, I believe, are, are the ones that are unfortunately out of print now. But Indicator is very good about bringing these titles back into print. So if you're interested in any of these and you can't find a copy of the box set itself on the used market, uh, you can pick up the standard editions of these films and the disc contents will be exactly the same. Uh, the only downside is, of course, you lose the wonderful limited edition box set packaging, uh, the lovely custom uh, digipacks for each film, and the wonderful book that's included. So these sets have now become real collector's items as soon as they're announced because the quality is such that uh, you're really getting what you pay for. And so it's it's really a good idea to uh, get these sooner rather than later if you're interested since they're all limited box sets. Uh, but this is the first volume in what is now five volumes. Now they've transitioned over into also doing Universal Noir boxes as well. So I figured since it's November and I had such a great time reviewing uh, their release this year of the fifth volume dealing entirely with Humphrey Bogart films that I would dig into the previous four volumes. So uh, volume one follows in the, the same sort of pattern. This is digging into uh, the Columbia vault or well, technically the Sony vault and releasing a lot of really some people would call them lesser noirs uh, for the most part but these are all noir titles or titles that can be considered in the noir realm uh, that are you know, available in, in uh, preservation masters from Sony in terms of HD masters. Some are new 2K scans, uh, a handful or even new 4K scans, depending on the title, like The Harder They Fall and The Bogart Set. But uh, this volume, volume one, really sets the precedent that the uh, further four volumes have followed, and now also their uh, trip into the Universal Noir realm with the uh, new box that they did this year of Universal titles. So it's the same sort of design and is featuring six really interesting films that are actually, it's a nice program of films because they're all uh, very distinct from one another. They're all a bit different and give you a sort of... Uh, hodgepodge or sampling of, of all the various realms of production eras that the uh, the whole noir genre can envelop in the Sony catalog. So it's really interesting looking at this set and going chronologically, starting with the first film, Escape in the Fog, and going all the way to the lineup, which big difference in years, uh, but also they are completely different films in terms of uh, their construction and their type and really the genre they fit into, but they all do have that sort of noir branding and enough of the iconography to be considered as such. So even though these are all titles that are not going to be the big A-tier attention-grabbing titles, they're all really worth your time and have been packaged together so beautifully and with such a, an incredible wealth of extras as Indicator is I think well known uh, these days, uh, or at least should be by now, for doing with every title they do, that these are going to be sets that you want to get and come back to time and time again, uh, whether it's Noir November or not, because they're so well put together. They have that sort of archival mentality to them. Now, the first film is 1945's Escape in the Fog, which is very much and readily apparent when you start it, a 1945 B-film programmer. But it's most interesting because it's also a very early directorial effort from Bud Bodeker. But this was, of course, before he became one of the greatest Western directors of all time. Uh, everyone has to start somewhere, and Bodeker himself did not speak very highly of his Columbia sort of programmer pictures. But uh, in this film, there already is a, a sort of displayed, uh, there's definitely a displayed difference between your typical B-movie fare. So even though it only is 63 minutes uh, and at times sort of has almost a bit of a, a serial vibe to it in terms of there's not very much characterization and the, the whole last act is, is very simple and straightforward, uh, it, there, there is some interesting stylization, and of course the titular fog is a key player to the point where you could really call the fog and the foggy night scenes on the, the stage sets of the city streets, because they're obviously on the stage, uh, or on the back lot I should say, uh, you could call the fog itself one of the main characters, and it is the most atmospheric and of course noir-esque of all the elements of the film. Uh, the film stars Otto Kruger, who actually has more of a secondary role, and uh, Nina Folk in an early role. But essentially, the, the premise, while it is 
a, a little bit on the silly side. It, 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 it doesn't sort of hit you over the head with it, but essentially you have the heroine having sort of nightmares of someone being attacked on a bridge in the fog, and of course that turns out to be the love interest she encounters, and actually those events become real and manifest themselves. So she actually finds herself on a foggy night on a bridge where guys jump out of a car and start beating up a guy and they're about to throw him off the bridge to his death. So it's sort of playing around with the with the concepts of dreams versus reality and, and also, again, in this wonderfully lit, foggy landscape. Now, of course, that might sound a little bit hokey, but you have to keep in mind this is a 1945 63-minute B programmer. So, again, characterization is very light, but there are a number of really interesting little bits and set pieces, particularly how the uh, the villains uh, discover the hero's plot, how they listen in on them, uh, what their actual uh, the, the actual guys they hide under is 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 really fascinating. Uh, the uh, basically the head of because it's 1945, it's a Nazi spy ring uh, that's I- I- hidden in the U.S. and the head of the spy ring is actually disguised has, has disguised himself as a reputable watchmaker and of course has to come and constantly repair the great grandfather clock in the study of the Otto Kruger character. So of course he can't be up to anything good, can he? <laughs> except being the most excellent repairman in the city. So, uh, again, this this will probably be the lightest sort of film that you're going to get in this set in terms of, if you're coming to these films for the first time, this is it definitely wears its origins on its sleeve. It is a B-film programmer. It is just barely over an hour. But uh, all of that aside, it remains actually a really fascinating little picture. Uh, B pictures could really do this, even if the story doesn't really give them much to play with. I think all the performances are actually really solid. Of course, the, 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 having such a short runtime means it only gets to develop to a certain point, and the whole third act is sort of a... a extended sort of chase to get to the the finale and you do have a sort of serial death trap type escape where the hero and heroine are sort of tied up in a room that's filling with gas so again if you're a a serial fan you'll recognize there are some uh, some touches and flourishes that feel very serial-esque which is what you're going to run into a lot with uh, especially 40s B films where they don't have a lot of runtime to play around with and the villain has some dastardly scheme and then there you know there has to be something for PR, our heroes to escape from and uh, it's it's an interesting sort of uh, methodology that is developed to escape shall we say but uh, again it's really remarkable what uh, Boudicca was able to do with such a simple uh, admittedly a bit goofy premise and how much atmosphere he's able to eke out of this. So again, I think this is one of those great little B films that uh, really manages to overcome some definite limitations, particularly in, in the, de- the story development. So there's not much uh, of development past a certain point, but it never overstays its welcome. That's another key thing because if, if this film was like this and it was say 90 or 100 minutes or even 80 or 85 minutes uh, you you definitely notice the flaws a lot more and be able to poke holes in it so there is definitely something to having a a, a, a great brevity in the runtime that that means the pace is increased and you're not questioning uh, you know potential plot holes and inaccuracies and uh, sort of silly goofiness in the story premise because the film is moving so fast. Another interesting thing is there's a very brief, you'll blink and you'll miss it, uh, there's essentially a walk-on part, and a, I, I wasn't aware that this was her first picture, but apparently this is the first appearance of Shelley Winters in a film as the uh, the attendant uh, hailing cabs for people during wartime. So again, you blink and you'll miss it, but you'll suddenly go, wait, that voice seems really familiar. And then she turns around and you're like, oh, okay. And apparently this was her first screen role. So um, I, I knew she had gotten started around this point, but I didn't realize this was actually her first screen role. And I, I will admit that seeing this on Blu-ray in this set, uh, I had seen it, uh, I, I had remembered it 
Uh, so I thought I had seen it before, and then watching it, I realized I had many years ago. Uh, I think just it turned up on uh, TCM one day or something. Um, but I, I suddenly remembered seeing it long before, and I really enjoyed seeing it on this Blu-ray presentation. So uh, even though it's a very short B-film programmer, there is there is some really interesting stuff to recommend in it, and it does have enough of the noir genre uh, iconography to identify it as such so it does fit here in this set um, some people like to play the whole is it noir is it not noir game and and really try and split hairs but this this is a fun little film and it's it's definitely people don't make b film programmers anymore it's not something that exists it's something of a bygone era and uh, of of the six films in the set i think it is the uh, obviously the simplest the quickest, the fastest, the shortest runtime, and uh, the most easily digestible because it's it's a fun little quick, uh, it, it, you know, sort of romp in the fog. Now this is credited as a 2K restoration, so to talk about the picture a little bit, this is Sony's 2K HD restoration. Uh, it does look quite nice, however, uh, and this was noted by others because this has been actually released on, uh, I believe it was one of the Noir Archive sets here in the U.S. Uh, got this uh, newer Sony Restoration Master. Uh, the overall transfer is actually quite dark. I, I, I am guessing that probably has something to do with the source because there is also, every time you have the, the fog-filled uh, fog sequences, uh, there does seem to be a sort of transition from the rest of the transfer. So the transfer is pretty dark, but then all of the fog sequences seem to have some fluctuations. I don't know if they were, I, I, I'm guessing maybe they were expressly photographed a bit darker than the rest of the film uh, to help further sort of highlight the fog and disguise the, the back lot and things like that. But you will notice there is some definite fluctuation throughout the transfer, uh, but the overall transfer is noticeably a bit dark. Uh, there's also a tiny amount or like a flash of, of flickering here and there, particularly in the opening titles. And you will see an occasional little speck of dirt here or there, but nothing really major or anything. On the audio side of things, it is, as Indicator always does, a lossless PCM mono track. I didn't notice any issues whatsoever. It sounded fine and healthy for a 1945 B-film programmer mono track. Uh, no problems in terms of hiss or distortion or any major issues. Now to turn to the packaging, this is in the lovely custom digipack that's exclusive to the box set. We have a beautiful printed version of the original artwork. The custom spine with the custom spine number for all the releases in this set. If I can get this to focus. Then the interior, as Indicator always does, usually has a still or a or an original poster. And then the disc label uses the same image as what's printed on the actual disc tray. And I, I must say, <laughs> I really love how, how this shot and this sequence is photographed because it, it's not very easy to, to look so photogenic when you're tied to a chair and, and <laughs> in a death trap. And I really love that they chose this for uh, not only the image, but the actual disc label itself. And of course, the rear has the boatload of extras and technical information. And as always, they have copied the original tagline on the back, which I really love. Now to go over the extras, there is a new commentary on all of these films. Uh, this has a track with Pamela Hutchinson. Uh, it's a very nice listen, but for because it's a 63-minute B-film programmer, there's not necessarily a lot to talk about, nor is there a lot of information around. So she does a great job at going into uh, Columbia B film programmers of the time, what you would expect from films like this, uh, where this film takes place in Bud Boudicca's career, how he was developing as a director, what his own opinions were on the film years later in interviews, sort of just brushing it off. And then she also has some great bits of uh, biographical insight about the various cast and crew and, and lead actors. So it's it's a good solid track without, you know, major dead space or anything. But again, because it's a 63 minute B film programmer, there's not necessarily the most information to talk about so it's a very well done commentary because films like this are actually 
quite a bit harder to do a track for, I think, than uh, more famous films or more notable films. So uh, just like if you had to do a track for a really long film and you have to fill all that space, well, it's actually also very difficult to do a track for a very short film with not a lot of information because you have less time to cover that material. Uh, then, as Indicator always does, there are plenty of extras in this set uh, tying into the historical time period of when these films were made. So this includes the 22-minute 1945 World War II documentary, The Fleet That Came to Stay, uh, which was compiled by Boudicca from combat footage during the Battle of Okinawa and uh, was apparently released shortly after this film. These I find fascinating because you're able to look directly at what the various crew and personnel who made these films were doing in terms of the war effort at around the same time period. That's not something that's going to get covered um, by most people or in most places, but it's, of course, absolutely key and essential to understand uh, what role they may have served in the war effort. If they weren't actually, uh, you know, in actual combat themselves, what they may have done uh, in the various motion picture divisions. And these are, of course, fascinating because it's actual real battle footage. And unless you're a major history nut or uh, you're really into surviving World War II combat footage, you're probably not going to have seen seen this and so even if the quality is not the greatest or it's sourced from standard depth materials and it's full of uh, scratches and damage from the actual battle itself uh, the, the the time capsule feel of these is indescribable so you may decide you're going to put on one of these for just a few minutes or sample it or whatever and before you know it you've watched the whole thing and I think this one's really interesting because Boudicca is the person who compiled and basically edited it and patched everything together, and it is uh, really well put together. So again, I, I, I thought I might just sample this or watch the whole thing later, and before I knew it, I had literally watched the whole thing because it's really well constructed. So uh, these extras are very much worth your time. Uh, don't uh, don't just skim over them and, and think that they're not really worth anything because uh, beyond what the simplistic nature of a war propaganda or war documentary might uh, seem like on the surface, its historical importance is far, uh, far more valuable than, uh, again, what the surface impression may be. And then the other major extra, this is something Fun Indicator did on most of the noir sets, uh, while Sony let them, uh, they included three Stooges shorts, which have been uh, restored over the years. Uh, so each of these discs has a three Stooges classic short that is at least some Somehow tangentially tied into the film. Uh, it's it's also a nice sort of palate cleanser because you go into a noir set, you don't expect a bunch of Three Stooges sorts literally tucked in there. Um, but I, I, I find it really amusing and, and fun to just dive into one of these in each of these discs. So here it's the 1940 You Nazi Spy, which of course tangentially is related to the film having a secret Nazi spy ring in the U.S. up to nefarious misdeeds. So once you see the film, then you can go to the extras and watch the boys themselves uh, deal with it in their own particular way. And of course, these have also been uh, restored and cleaned up by Sony over the years. Uh, and it's really interesting to see them on Blu-ray because the Sony restorations are only currently available in DVD sets. And I think some of these uh, are actually slightly better than what's in the DVD box sets. I'm, I'm not exactly 100% on that, but it is in really incredible to see them in HD on these Blu-ray releases. And again, uh, apparently Sony uh, said that they couldn't do that anymore, which is why uh, they're not on the uh, Bogart set, for example. But uh, again, each of these discs has a various Three Stooges sort included. Uh, then we also get the wonderful, very extensive Indicator Image Gallery, which not only is production and set stills, but also all kinds of posters and foreign release uh, press materials that they could find. So these are always really well done and very, very uh, detailed. And so it's not just the same sort of image gallery you get most of the time where it's just like five or 10 pictures or two or three pictures and they call it a photo gallery. Uh, this is totally the opposite of that. So they're, they're always the absolute best at the uh, inclusion of photo galleries because it's much more than just some set stills. And then they go on to say that uh, new and improved English subtitles have been made for this release, which again is something that I think they really pride themselves on doing. And 
they should because most people and unfortunately most labels overlook uh, the the actual subtitling being um, you know actually correct and readable and enjoyable. Um, I, I, I myself and most people won't ever have to use them, but if you do uh, actually require subtitles, Indicator always um, at least double checks and goes through, if not uh, actually makes brand new subtitles for every release that they do. Uh, so that is to always be commended. And it's also the UK premiere of the film on Blu-ray. Again, as I said, uh, the Sony master of this was released in a set over here in the US, but Nowhere near as well encoded as this indicator disc, and of course without all these lovely extras. Next is 1949's The Undercover Man, which might be considered more of a crime drama or... It's not necessarily a police procedural, but it does really preface a lot of things that people might associate with The Untouchables, because the film deals with a group of treasury agents headed by Glenn Ford's character uh, who are going after a... Uh, notably unnamed uh, major crime boss who essentially is Al Capone, but they were not allowed to name real-life figures in this film, so it's always the person seen in shadow or referred to simply as the boss. Uh, but it's essentially a group of treasury agents and their efforts to nail and uh, nail this crime boss and eliminate corruption in the city and the various uh, roadblocks they run into in the legal system and uh, people not wanting to get involved and not wanting to incriminate themselves or others and, of course, worrying about their own safety and their family's safety in this actual city environment. Uh, it's very notable for being directed by Joseph Lewis, who around this time period would go on to direct the masterpiece noir Gun Crazy. And he manages to, I think, really elevate this film with a certain degree of natural realism. There is quite a bit of uh, location footage. It's not all on uh, sound stages. And there is a nice sort of energy that's created because of this. You really do feel as if you are getting involved with these treasury agents and uh, their continual attempts that don't work, whether it's uh, informants who wind up dying under mysterious circumstances or cryptic threats they receive or uh, simply not getting any place and being stuck in the office with endless amounts of paperwork. So I think the most uh, striking aspect of, of the film's story and what makes it really work is it doesn't just go in for highlighting the most dramatic aspects of the of the real life scenario you would find yourself in. Uh, it very much keeps things grounded and is never afraid to remind the audience that things are not always uh, shootouts and uh, or uh, you know being threatened or uh, again the most dramatic highlights that you would get uh, in uh, I'd say lesser fair this has such a wonderful degree of keeping the grounded realism of there is the mundane in in the in the life of a treasury agent. Try even if you're trying to nail a, a an entire cr a criminal empire and an entire city, and it also of course goes into the melodramatic side of things because of course the Ford character uh, is has has to worry about his wife who he winds up sending off to an idyllic farm and of course they even find her there and of course coming from Escape in the Fog you go into this film and the wife character is played again by Nina Folk so it's interesting seeing uh, how some actors and actresses or performers or or crew members might pass from one film to another and you might see what their work is like a couple years down the road, even if the films are completely different in this box set. Uh, again, I think uh, the, the naturalism that's generated by, by Lewis, uh, especially driving this point, is the key to what makes this film work. Uh, outside of that, the, the actual plot and the script itself is very straightforward, and I think in other people's hands, I don't think it would be anywhere near as effective, uh, particularly if it was all entirely uh, in the studio environment and didn't have the efforts to at least try to make it feel more naturalistic. And if you're a great fan of Gun Crazy, as you should be, because it's one of the great noirs, uh, you, you will totally recognize a lot of the elements that Lewis brought to this film are also so present in Gun Crazy. Again, that's sort of at least getting a spirit of naturalism and sort of making sure the, the story feels like it's set firmly in the real world. So I think that is 
the, the greatest aspect to what makes this film really tick, and that is further highlighted by as practically every time he's on screen, Glenn Ford giving a very committed performance with a with a great deal of energy and gravitas and also the the ability to sort of back off of that in the lighter moments and of course the more emotional moments when uh, his character is really feeling the pressure of being threatened by the weight of a criminal organization. So it 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 manages to actually stay pretty grounded, which is very striking for a crime film from 1949 that is ostensibly based on real events. That's the other thing. This is essentially doing what would now be termed ripped from the headlines or doing an actual real life story. That what, what hurts that is the fact that they're not allowed to use all the real names. And so there, there's a, a little bit of, of fun with that because some characters, as I mentioned, are never actually named. But I think the film is really at its best when it, it really hones this sort of naturalistic energy that I think is is um, actually unique to a, to a number of, of films Lewis directed that are now considered part of the noir genre and canon. And again, all this stuff you see turn up in Gun Crazy. So if you've never seen another film or another noir that Lewis directed uh, and you really love Gun Crazy, again, as you should, um, this this will be a really interesting and very uh, rewarding experience because you'll be able to recognize a lot of the same sort of techniques and, and themes and a lot of the same feeling, I think, is also here in The Undercover Man, which, again, on the surface seems like it will be a, a pretty straightforward, almost almost sort of like a 1940s version of The Untouchables, actually, which is kind of, kind of interesting. So if you love The Untouchables and you always wondered, is there anything from decades past besides the the television series and, and, the, and the radio program, things like that, uh, that sort of has that same feeling? Obviously, it would be a bit drier and, and less uh, over the top and things. Uh, this is pretty much it. Uh, I, I think I think it would very much be uh, very pleasing for fans of The Untouchables to come see this because you'll, you'll recognize a lot of the same shared DNA. Now, this is another Sony 2K restoration. Uh, to talk about the picture, I think this looks quite good throughout. Uh, however, there are um, some anomalies that pop up as, as you are going to have in, in most things that haven't been the full royal 4k catalog restoration treatment i did notice uh two or three very very minor things the opening is a little bit bright uh, when they arrive at the train station and then uh, once they're actually inside the station the first real major sequence of the film where the four characters essentially waiting to find out if he can make his uh, contact with his informant. Uh, there is one very, very tiny bit of a, it seems like it's really just one missing frame, which seems inherent to uh, whatever source Sony was using. And uh, these, these uh, Sony restorations are usually so well done that uh, it's very rare for them to have missing frames. So usually that that's a sign that there was literally no other thing they could do. And so you'll see a very, very imperceptible jump uh, right there. And it's literally just one frame that's missing. And then the only other thing video wise that I noticed really was at the very, very end and the actual end credits, there's a tiny amount of uh, frame wobble in there. But outside of that, it's a lovely Sony catalog restoration. It is a 2K scan, uh, so it looks much better than what it would had it been an old uh, Sony HD master. And I think it does have a really healthy appearance. Uh, this is, of course, Academy Ratio still, 1949, black and white, and that gives it a certain flavor, particularly when they're actually doing location footage and they're actually out in the real world, you have the actors going around, uh, particularly in some really nice dialogue scenes and the, the final act of the film. So I think uh, visually it's a really nice experience. Uh, the, the anomalies, I think, are baked into the source, and Sony did the best they could. On the audio side, it's once again PCM mono. Uh, it sounds great for the most part, but I did on this one notice that there were some uh, bits of noticeable distortion and a little tiny bit of crackle a little bit here and there. So it, it, especially if you have a, a nice sound system or uh, some uh, large speakers, uh, you will notice some occasional bits of inherent noise and and distortion coming in here and there under some of the dialogue it's never bad or, or very intrusive but it is noticeable uh particularly if you're like me and you you notice things like that but 
On the other hand, uh, you, you don't want that to be removed with overzealous noise reduction. So uh, for my own taste, I prefer things to be left alone. So I don't mind hearing a little bit of crackle and distortion and noise uh, here and there, uh, as opposed to having uh, heaping amounts of noise reduction applied, which is unfortunately uh, what you find on most releases and restorations. So uh, even if you might hear a little bit of noise here and there, that is far preferable to uh, the unfortunate fate that most audio tracks face. So you will notice maybe a little bit of that here and there. Again, it's never intrusive, but uh, depending on how good your sound system is, you, you may notice it more than others might. Uh, I definitely noticed it a little bit here and there, but it was never bad or very intrusive. So again, is the lovely DigiPack with original poster art, and I don't know how well this will come across on camera, but the printing on these is really exceptional. Uh, the, the colors really pop when you hold these and you, you look at them. Uh, I, I've always been amazed at how well Indicator does with, with these because most of the times you get a digipack, you know, it's it's only going to be a certain level of quality to the actual, to, it's like the actual inks themselves. So I, I really enjoy how, how wonderful these are in terms of the quality and there's always a nice textured feel to the actual, um, to the actual cardstock itself. Now the interior has a still and then the disc label and then amusingly they've used the shot from the actual movie theater that the characters go into and <laughs> most most fun is the fact that this is where at the beginning of the film this is where Ford's character actually meets his informant inside of a movie theater so it's a little bit of a you know a wink at the audience which, which I, I enjoy and you remove the disc to find Ford there on the disc tray And here's the rear, again with the tagline. To go over the extras, which again are really nice. Uh, there, it's obviously Sony's 2K restoration with the mono audio track. Uh, this has a brand new audio commentary with Tony Raines. And interestingly, this is one of the few commentary tracks you'll come across where uh, he gets going and in terms of discussing the film and it actually runs longer than the film itself. So uh, literally the film will end and he keeps talking for a few more minutes and indicators just put some uh, some a black leader in there, so you you know don't worry that the film is over and the track is still going. Uh, so he actually goes about three to five minutes longer than the actual film, which is uh, you know, I I don't mind. You know, it's it's, a, it's such a rarity that I was I was very surprised to suddenly see. I'm like, wait, the movie's over. <laughs> oh, he's still going. Okay, uh, sounds like one of my commentary tracks. Um, but anyway, uh, it's it's a it's a very solid track. Uh, he does talk a great deal about the production of this film. Uh, again, it was based on real events, but he talks also a great deal uh, about this film in Joseph Lewis's uh, filmography and what uh, Lewis was really well known for and what he sort of brings to this film and, and also comparing it to Lewis's other films, particularly Gun Crazy. So it's a rewarding commentary track. I mean, every commentary on on an indicator release is worth your time um so there there's there's never i've never encountered a bad one or a pointless one um so i, I really appreciate that they go to select people and uh really come up with commentary tracks that are really worth your time even for releases like this and titles like this that are much lesser known much less discussed and have very little available information on them uh, then we continue with another of the vintage pieces. This is a 30-minute short from 1945 called Man on a Bus, which Lewis made for the United Jewish Appeal, which essentially, when you look at it, it's a promotional film. Uh, it's also, you know, it's telling essential parables of all these characters on a bus in Israel and, and how their, their lives are affected by the changing of the country and how they interact with each other. So, you know, in terms of the writing, it's obviously a little bit heavy-handed. It's it's obviously a promotional piece, and it is bookended by you know please donate to to our organization. But uh, it's fascinating to see things like this because they are artifacts of a different time, and all the roles are performed by really notable names. So you've got everyone from Broderick Crawford to even Walter Brennan and Ruth Roman in here. Uh, so you will find things if you're a fan of classic Hollywood, of course, to 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 enjoy in this, even if 
it's not going to be something that you would choose to actually put on and watch as as your movie of the night. Um, but again, it's it's fascinating to look at things that the key crew and personnel would be doing around this time period. And again, also tied into sort of uh, you know social issues of the time and the uh, the immediacy of the post war period. Um, so it's it's really nice to have these things included because if they're not here, then uh, you know, there's no telling where you would actually be able to find or access or have any knowledge of these materials. So, uh, again, I really do commend Indicator for uh, including things like this simply for historical purposes. Then the boys themselves return in Income Tax Sappy uh, from 1954. So we get a- another uh, Sony Restored Three Stooges short here. And, of course, in this short, the boys are dealing with the IRS and income tax evasion. So... Very loosely ties in to the Treasury agent theme of this film, but it's it's a wonderful inclusion uh, in this noir set. I, I love that they did this. It's such a wonderful gag idea. And then once again, we get a wonderful, very extensive indicator image gallery, again, loaded with great stills and publicity materials and posters and lobby cards. Uh, and then on top of that, new and improved subtitles and the fact that this is the premiere of the film on Blu-ray. So... This is by far and away the best release there is of this film. So it's not just one that has you know already been released here by another label. Um, this is the actually the premiere uh, on the HD format of this film. Next is 1954's Drive a Crooked Road, which was written by Blake Edwards and directed by Richard Quine and features an absolutely brilliant breathtaking, uh, expectation shattering, I would say, performance by Mickey Rooney. It's Actually, it may very well be. I think it may be my favorite performance of his in anything ever. Uh, he is uh, still an incredibly underrated uh, star, and of course, uh, most people know that he was the you know, <laughs> as the old old sketch goes, was the most famous star in the world at the at the peak of his career at MGM and the classic days of Hollywood. But by this point in the fifties. He was having to really, you know, was really having to struggle to overcome typecasting and being looked at as a has been. And there's some really interesting pictures in the mid 50s around this time period. But this one in particular, um, I think, uh, really due to uh, the, the 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 wonderful nuances of Edwards's script and the no nonsense but still uh, very measured direction of Quine. I think he turns in a performance that is, you know, it's it's hard to describe because he's playing a character that is a definite outsider, which is you know seemingly the opposite of what you picture Mickey Rooney as in a film, uh, but he is, you know, withdrawn and very quiet, very shy, but very very kind. He's a pitiable character uh, and someone you immediately feel sympathy for. Uh, so much so that it it almost seems like what would you know you would if this type of character was in a film now uh, they most likely would be uh, I don't know necessarily that uh, they were thinking about things like this but you might consider this character perhaps being uh, you know at least if he wasn't on the autistic spectrum he might have some sort of uh, he obviously has some sort of inability to connect with other people. And uh, seeing this film, I can't help but get the feeling that he's doing things with this performance uh, in in terms of what Rooney's doing. Um, He's kind of doing things, uh, you know, over 20 years before you see it in Taxi Driver. Like that's that's the type of sort of intensity of a loner type uh, lead character, the uh, sense that you're getting in this film. And the, the, the plot is very straightforward and definitely not only plays with that audience sympathy, but it, it sets up quite a deal of suspense because you can see where this is going and how dark it's going to go. And most of all, you're you're absolutely terrified of what uh, the Rooney character's reaction will be uh, to essentially being, uh, being utterly and totally and completely used by other people and it in such a way that he has never quite experienced before. Uh, you, you start to feel great deals of suspense because you don't know if he'll be able to even cope with the with the concept of this. Now, the plot is Rooney's character is a part-time race driver who aspires to uh, join the Grand Prix and be one of the greatest drivers in the world, but in his everyday life is and just a regular garage mechanic. Uh, 
Uh, he has a very empty existence. He lives in a small room that he rents that is perfectly ordered, and you see all the, the various trophies he's won in auto races, but he's never, he's not really getting much of anywhere. Uh, he doesn't have the ability to really connect with anyone. He doesn't have major close friendships outside of the work environment, and even those seem very one-sided and stilted because he seems completely disassociated from uh, not just the world, but humanity itself. And like he's carrying this 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 great pain and self-loathing the entire time. Um, but essentially, he is chosen as as the sort of mark. Uh, for uh, or the patsy or the fall guy uh, uh, for a scheme, uh, basically a bank robbery scheme, and uh, the the femme fatale sort of character played by Diane Foster is the sort of setup. She's the bait and the honey trap to sort of lure him in. But what's of course interesting is the fact that she doesn't like it, and she starts to feel the same sort of sympathy for Rooney's character that the audience feels, and that of course further complicates matters. But I think what really makes the film truly interesting and uh, what starts to play with your expectations quite a bit is what they do with the the extra inducement once the uh, Rooney character discovers he's, he's going to be used, that this is a sort of plot and a setup, but also uh, what they do with the villain, with the, with the brains of this scheme. Uh, the main villain of the film is played by Kevin McCarthy from Invasion of the Body Snatchers fame, of course. So you have to shake the feeling that Dr. Miles Bennell is planning a bank robbery on in a beach house. You know? um, but it's, it's wonderful what he does with this role. Again, it's very much a, a deeper and more multifaceted take on this type of character, as all of, of the lead roles are. Uh, I think that is all down to Blake Edwards' screenplay, which is very adept at uh, what should be a very simple scenario. Uh, he, he's very adept at really deepening the the uh, interpersonal relationships of these characters and there's a lot more going on under the surface than what it originally seems but uh, McCarthy's villain character once he puts it out there that he wants him to be involved in this bank job the extra inducement to Rooney's character is to perform this uh, they will have to essentially have a getaway driver who will have to go on back roads that are extremely hazardous, and he will have to travel over a certain distance at a ridiculously short amount of time. And so the, the inducement is not only will he get a cut in the share of the profits, not only does he think that uh, the woman of the group is hopelessly in love with him, but that it's the greatest racing challenge he's ever been given. And for once, someone is actually asking him to do something that at least feels somewhat worthwhile then he has to struggle with his conscience because, of course, it's against the law and they're going to be robbing a bank. So it's it's fascinating seeing this being added in because it, the, the idea is, even if no one knows it, he himself has now proven to himself only that he can do something uh, as challenging as this feat. Again, it is the greatest sort of race he has ever been uh, challenged with. So there's that essential, essentially that sort of throwing down of the gauntlet of, oh, well, you think you're the best driver in these parts. Well, here you go. Uh, just so happens to be a bank job. So it, it's, it's that little extra uh, bit of business that I found really fascinating. And, of course, the suspense is still building because uh, when the Rooney character is presented with this, uh, we already know that he's being, you know, strung along and he doesn't know all the particulars and details of what everyone's actual plans are. So, uh, as I said before, there's a nice degree of suspense that goes in with, ha goes hand in hand with the uh, extreme sympathy and pity that the audience feels for Rooney's character. And you know that when things reach that breaking point, uh, things are going to boil over and they're going to boil over really fast and it's probably not going to go well for anybody uh, because this is still noir land so of course it's not going to go well for anybody but i, I think it's it, the, the real striking aspects are the attention to detail and not just being a typical noir story not just being about a bank heist uh edwards's script really paying attention to the nuances of character the 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 character sensibilities and chiefly uh, in Rooney's performance, which is just incredible. It's 
I mean, it's criminal. He wasn't nominated for an Oscar for this performance. It's that good. It, he wouldn't have been because this was not an A-tier picture, and he wouldn't have won because it's the year of Brando and On the Waterfront, but he should have at least been nominated. It's that good of a performance. Um, he could have won the Oscar. It's that good. Um, I, 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 I really want to stress that for people who have never paid much attention to him as an actor. Um, yeah, you know, the, Olivier himself praised Rooney like crazy saying that you know he, that was the person he watched in terms of trying to be inspired and learn things about acting so I think that speaks volumes um the man could do anything uh and and this I think is just an incredible uh performance it's it's definitely the thing you remember most particularly uh, after the the wonderful sensitivity of the film's ending uh, I think for me personally the only thing that 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 uh, kind of holds the film back a little bit is the ending is not necessarily rushed, but it does definitely, it, it comes to an end rather quickly. And I, I just personally, I wish the final shot had, had a little, had, had run maybe a, maybe a couple more feet, you know, uh, just have a little bit more breathing room in, in the last reel. But uh, that's, that's only a minor quibble. I think this is a, a remarkable little noir from this time period in the mid fifties where films like this could come out and people could see them and remember them, even if they might get swallowed up and, in the sort of circuit and sort of just come and go and would be quickly forgotten by everyone else. But uh, for those who have seen this film, it's a film you don't forget. I think it's extremely well cast, beautifully written. And I think Blake Edwards is really underrated for his, for his, uh, for his writing, actually. He's of course famed for his comedy work, but he had a real knack for character sensibilities. Of course, to understand this, all you have to do is see Days of Wine and Roses, and you, you get that in spades, and you can't believe that it's Blake Edwards directing this. Um, I, I think it's, it's it's kind of a shame in one way that uh, he went so far into comedy that uh, he wound up not doing as much uh, noir or crime dramas or melodramas or all the things he was doing before uh, his his uh, comedy career really took off. It was sort of sprinkled in in other films. Uh, you can get maybe a dash of it in SOB and other things, uh, which are satires, but they have a, have a bit of character melodrama sort of sprinkled in there. But um, I, I think that's that's the real key, along with the great performances and the wonderful direction that make this really memorable and uh were it, it were it not for uh, this set also including uh the lineup which is the don siegel film which i'll talk about last because it you know last chronologically um were it not for the set including the lineup I, I i would say this is the best film in the set actually um and i think it actually rivals the lineup for for that title um in terms of being the best film in this set because it's really well done and I think of all six uh, in this this box, I think this one actually might have the the most longevity. This is going to be the one I think you you might think of uh, the most often. I think it's got the most staying power actually because Rooney's performance is so uh, just strikingly multifaceted and. You truly feel sorry for this guy. Uh, I mean, throughout the whole picture, and uh, d people didn't write or perform characters like this. It's not a cliched character. It's not just oh, this guy's a loser, so he doesn't talk very much. You truly get the sense that he has, even if it's not diagnosed, that he might have some sort of uh, social um, inability to connect with people. Like he might have. Uh, you know, if if he may not be uh, an, an artistic character, you you get that sense that there's something there. Like this is someone who desperately wants to, you know, just be a normal person and be able to connect with people, but just can't find that in themselves, and that causes them to retreat further. And seeing it this time, I just was struck that uh, struck by the fact that it just felt like this is uh, quite a bit of what turns up in Travis Bickle, you know, 22 years later. And you don't see this talked about. It's it, an absolutely brilliant performance. And again, I think it may be, at least for me, I, I haven't seen everything he ever did because, of course, Mickey Rooney's credits list is massive. But if you've only ever seen the the peak career Mickey Rooney at MGM and all the co-starring vehicles with Judy Garland um, 
this will blow your mind. Again, he should have been at least nominated for an Oscar. That's how amazing this performance is. It may be the best performance he ever gave in a movie, That and that speaks volumes. Um, it's absolutely incredible. So um, the, the whole set is worth it for this one film, I would say. Um, so uh, it's an absolutely incredible noir if you've never seen it. Uh, highlighted by wonderful performances, incredible performances, actually. I'll go ahead and say uh, a really intricately uh, put-together script that pays attention to character motivations like like you wouldn't believe, particularly for a, a you know a lower budgeted 1954 crime thriller that falls into the noir genre. So again, I think this is one of the absolute highlights of the set and uh, just filled with incredible performances. So now we talk about the uh, video quality. This is a Sony HD Master, so it has not gotten a new scan. Uh, it obviously doesn't look as spiffy then as some of the newer 2K scans in this set, but the quality is still really excellent as every Sony HD master they have uh, that they've done in over the years pretty much is. Um, when Sony does a master, they, they usually put more into it than a lot of the other studios in terms of, uh, you know, over the past 10, 20 years. It's, of course, spherical 185 to 1 in black and white, and there's always something really nice and interesting to widescreen black and white films. Um, there's no issues with the print transfer itself, uh, no major damage or anything, so I was very pleased. And of course, that is befitting of it being a Sony master. They usually are, are the best at, or you know, have been the best at sort of ironing out things like that. On the audio side of things, it's once again, lossless PCM mono. Uh, this is where you'll notice some stuff. There is There are a couple spots where you're going to notice some bits of the light distortion and a little bit of light crackle and, and a few music cues and in one or two scenes under some dialogue. It's never major or very intrusive. And again, as I mentioned before, I'd much rather studios or labels leave these things as is and not mess with them because when you start going in trying to remove things like that, almost 100% of the time they get too carried away and you lose valuable audio frequency and then tracks are over noise reduced. So if you have a more discerning ear or if you have a better setup, you will notice a, a bit of crackle and distortion in a few places. It's, again, never very intrusive. It's never bad or anything, uh, but you will notice a couple spots of that. Now, here is the wonderful package with the film's one sheet. Again, the color really jumps off, so I always love the printing of these. The interior has a shot from the opening and then the wonderful shot of Rooney's character towards the climax uh, with all the conflicting emotions playing across his face is used for the disc label and the tray itself. Here is the rear with the tagline and all of the extras. Now this one has a bit more in terms of the extras. We have a brand new Nick Pinkerton commentary, which is really well done, and it was a very enjoyable listen. He talks about the film's production, its place in the sort of release slate. Uh, he talks about uh, Quine's career. He talks about a great deal about Blake Edwards and uh, the, re the working relationship between Edwards and Quine. They had done several films together. And then uh, Mickey Rooney's involvement, where this film falls in Rooney's career. And he also talks about the, the other performers and the great new nuances in Edwards's script and how the, how wonderfully they all perform uh, those those various nuances so it's a really great commentary but you actually technically have a second commentary because the secondary audio track also includes a Guardian interview with Mickey Rooney, which was done in 1988 and was sort of a live uh, interview and question and answer session but it is feature length it's the length of the film so it's actually uh, placed on a second audio track so essentially you're getting two audio commentaries and uh, Mickey Rooney was nothing but the most entertaining and interesting interview subject that may have ever existed so uh, there's never a dull moment in this track and uh, or should say in this interview uh, and of course he is very quick to poke fun at himself and, and 
literally take the mickey out of himself. So um, while there might be, you know, some telling of tall tales and things like that, it's a really interesting and I think rewarding listen. So essentially you're getting uh, two commentaries for the price of one. Then there's also a two-minute Martin Scorsese introduction, which was done for Sony. I really love it anytime Scorsese gets to start talking about films. It's a shame it's only two minutes, but he does, even in that short time, give some really nice insights that sort of uh, go along with what's discussed in the commentary. Then there's also a really fascinating uh, 10 minute short from 1953 entitled Screen Snapshots, where uh, Mickey Rooney himself uh, gets to view old footage of himself from his earlier days as a child actor. And that sort of gives you a, a nice insight into how the industry viewed him at this point in time and how he was trying to relaunch himself uh, as an actor and break out of the, the, the image and the typecasting that people had for him. Um, so it's it's a fascinating piece, and I'm so happy that they included it here because it really drives all that stuff home that's discussed in the commentary and the interview of uh, where Rooney's career was at that time period in the mid-1950s. Then the Stooges short is Higher Than a Kite, where the boys find themselves working as auto mechanics. So there's your connection. <laughs> I love seeing what the very tangential link is between the short they put on in the film. Uh, they're auto mechanics, so it it, 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 it fits. Go with it. Um, but it's, again, a, a really, it's a classic Stooges short, and it's included on Blu-ray from this Sony restoration, and it's really fascinating seeing these on Blu-ray. So the hope is, of course, that Sony will put the whole Stooges catalog out in a beautiful, fully remastered and restored Blu-ray set with all kinds of historical and archival features, which they have done on DVD, but I, I think they might be working on that, which might be why they told Indicator to stop doing Stooges shorts on these noir sets, but uh, I just love the fact that they put these in here because it totally <laughs> doesn't go with the noir vibe. <laughs> Uh, then, of course, we get to the wonderful uh, image gallery with all the wonderful stills, poster images. But the original trailer is also included. Uh, not all films, of course, have their trailer survive, so it's great to have it when it's available. And it is actually an HD scan of the trailer, which was nice to see because most trailers are presented in you know, old standard def copies of really beat up trailers or even reissue trailers. So having the trailer is great. Having it in a new HD scan is even better, so that's a really wonderful inclusion. Uh, it goes on to mention the new and improved English subtitles, and that this is the world premiere of the film on Blu-ray. So this is where you will need to go to see this incredible film, which I highly, highly recommend. Uh, and if you ever needed convincing that Mickey Rooney was a legendary actor, well, here you go. Um, again, this is you know should have been nominated for an Oscar-worthy level. Uh, career best performance material. It's an absolutely uh, incredibly acted film. Actually, across the board, again, all, all the leads are great. Uh, but Rooney in particular, this will really blow your socks off if you only know him from his MGM days. Um, so I'm so happy Indicator decided to do this title. And again, it is the world premiere of the film on Blu-ray. And I think it's worth the cost of the whole set. Um, but if you're looking at just getting these individually now because the set is out of print, uh, this is, I think, an absolute must title. Next is 1955's Five Against the House, which apparently is a big favorite of Scorsese's uh, and seems rather obvious, if, I guess, if you see Casino later on. But uh, this film is rather interesting because it's you know obviously a noir still, but it has a sort of different sort of setup for its protagonist and essentially carries on some of the same themes as the other films in this set in terms of actually getting into real natural locations. Uh, they did do quite a bit of location shooting on this film in Reno, Nevada at the actual Herald's Club Casino, uh, which is the the casino they, the characters decide to rob after they visit it at the beginning of the film. So it gives a nice sort of verisimilitude and degree of realism to the actual events of the story that, and that lovely time capsule sort of flavor because they're actually going to the real casino and you see exactly how it was in the mid-1950s. Now, the film deals with a group of college students uh, and rather amusingly, our, our two leads played by Guy Madison and Brian Keith are significantly older, uh, but it is explained that they are essentially Korean War veterans on uh, the GI Bill going to school after serving. So it sort of helps to explain away the age a little bit, uh, but it is rather jarring since 
all of the actors in this sort of group of friends are significantly older. Uh, so you, you take that with a grain of salt. It is what it is. Uh, but essentially, they go uh, on a weekend to Reno and, you know, have fun at the casino, but actually uh, get stuck in the middle of a very improperly planned <laughs> attempt at a holdup. And this uh, sort of interesting idea of what would have happened had the person gotten away with it sticks with uh, one particular uh, group or member of the group. Uh, it, it sticks in his mind. Uh, he's played by Kerwin Matthews, and uh, he gets basically obsessed with trying to uh, find a new way to prove himself by planning the perfect casino heist robbery. And you know, once he develops this supposedly great plan just to do something fun and interesting because they're apparently all bored out of their minds, uh, that this starts to take hold to a point that he tells all the other guys about it. And at first it gets laughed off, but others start to really uh, buy into this plan. What's interesting is that none of the characters necessarily are out for a monetary value in terms of they're not doing this because they need the money. Uh, the Matthews character himself is the son of a very rich family and even expresses many times it's basically because he's bored of his mind and he wants to do something challenging and apparently they're not getting that challenge at the university they're in. Um, it, it, it's interesting in that uh, again, none of the characters really are going to do this because they need the money, and things build to it, uh, build to a head essentially where there isn't a way for them to back out, and that's uh, is primarily due to the Brian Keith character struggling with uh, forms of what apparently would be uh, today considered PTSD after his war service, and uh, trying to avoid going to an army hospital for observation and uh, at least some sort of psychiatric treatment. So he's trying to just pretend to be normal on the surface, but over the course of the film, his uh, ferocious anger threatens to break through to a point where once this uh, the wheels are starting to be greased into motion about this uh, plot to rob a casino simply out of boredom, uh, he becomes the driving force, and then eventually it becomes a matter of he threatens all of his friends to continue this, other, uh, otherwise he will expose them and or kill them. So... That's If you didn't think this had enough to qualify as a noir for the sort of opening third, opening half, uh, once that comes into play, then you are definitely smack dab in noir territory. And it builds nice suspense throughout the casino robbery sequence because they're really doing it under duress. And you get the fun bit of actually seeing how this plot unfolds because we're sort of kept in the dark about uh, what this grand master plan scheme is to rob the actual casino. And once again, uh, we have the opening actually shot on location in the casino, and then we return to Reno at that location for the finale and the actual robbery. So that sort of bookending of the real world location really heightens the drama because you are actually there and you see how this plot unfolds in the real location actually filled with patrons. It's not like they went there at, you know, four o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday when, you know, there was like a, uh, only a couple people around. The whole casino is filled and you have the, all, all the workers and the attendants and everything. And that uh, it's, it's amazing they pulled it off, particularly in the mid-1950s and let alone getting the permission to do so. And it wasn't a, a, a big A budget feature either. The film was directed by Phil Carlson, who did a number of really notable uh, noirs throughout the 1950s, uh, films like The Phoenix City Story, for example. And this sort of does have some of the flavor of those if you've seen some of his other noir titles. Uh, I think the film is, of course, also most notable for being uh, really a big premiere for Kim Novak as a new Columbia star player. Uh, she was being built up to stardom at this point. And she really is luminous, and, and they, give, of course, give her a song number because her character is working in a nightclub as a singer and is romantically involved with uh, our, our lead character, played by Guy Madison. So, you know, of course, she's going to have a song number where she gets to, you know, have, basically they stop the film and she gets to look fantastic and sound great. Uh, but she really does have uh, this wonderful energy, the energy she always had and in, in pr pretty much everything she ever did. Uh, it's already on display, so she already has that star quality. And this is one of the highlights of the film, even though, unfortunately, she doesn't get a whole, whole lot to do. Uh, she does become, uh, in terms of her character, does become part of the overall plot, uh, not by choice, sort of gets swept up into things. But again, it just becomes a matter of her character sort of being in the middle of everything and not being given too much to do. 
but uh, when when she's actually given time to shine is usually in the little romantic interludes where they're able to sort of steal a moment away and 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 talk about their future and things like that and uh, again she's a really great presence in this film and that's not something very easy to do when you're really just starting out and the studio is trying to build you up as a star and you've got a part in a film like this that's really a a crime thriller noir focusing on the male leads and you're just sort of the the token female role there and you you don't have a whole lot to do so it's a very difficult sort of balancing act and uh i I was very surprised coming to this again uh that uh, she just has that star quality already there and uh, is again one of the highlights of the film uh so i think the the real draws of this are Phil Carlson's direction, uh, it, uh, Kim Novak's performance really sort of helping to uh, bolster everything, and the real-world footage, the actual footage of the actual casino location in Reno, and you get that time capsule you are there. Uh, they also very heavily feature the then-new sort of a gimmick invention that they had there in Reno of the automated car garage where uh, you have the basically the big forklift elevator type device that you bring your car in and then it literally lifts your car up and then parks it in a certain level that features in the uh, basically in those bookending segments it becomes one of the key locations of the film um, uh, for me personally I would say that I, I do think it is in terms of the plotting and the story I do think it is it it sort of balance itself balances itself more on the lighter side of things in terms of I think it plays it safe a little bit uh, and the extras they go into the original story this this was based on by Jack Finney which apparently was quite a lot darker uh, which would explain I think quite a bit of why this film I felt played things a bit safe and was a bit on the light side. It does seem to set itself up for a very true noir darker ending and it doesn't quite go there um which which i felt uh, feel is a little bit disappointing uh i know not everyone's going to have that reaction but i really would like to go read the original story now since apparently it is significantly darker but uh, the trade-off there is apparently the story characters the characters in the original story are themselves not really likable at all and and, and mostly terrible people so you know that there, there, there is a bit of a trade-off so I, I do think it was very wise to change that for the film however I, I think it might have been a bit better if uh, the film had a little bit more grittiness here and there and that's not to say it doesn't have grittiness because of course it's Phil Carlson directing it, so you already know what you're getting going into it. I, I also think it is a bit of a shame that so much of the film takes place in the setup. You know, once they go back to college, that's the the big chunk of the film, and then uh, it's only in really the last act where they're traveling to Reno, and then they get back there, and then the actual heist itself. Um, it's it's well staged and executed and very suspenseful, but it is. It does feel a tad bit rushed, I would say. I, I wish that more screen time essentially had been given to really milking every last bit of suspense out of that and, and letting it play out in real time more. Um, the film does do that, but it, I, I just don't think it's quite as effective as, as I wish it would be. If uh, I think it would have been a bit, quite a bit better had uh, there been less time spent at, you know, back at college and building up to the heist uh, and and more time in the actual heist itself. Uh, if any have seen this film and, and uh, might have thought similar things or, or if I'm totally off base, let me know in the comments. But that's just my own personal reading. So I still think it's a really solid film that has a lot of great things to recommend in it. And it's uh, far more effective than you would think for a lower tier Columbia noir from the 1950s. But the big selling point is it's you know an early film for Kim Novak uh, and the real world footage of actually being in Reno and actually displaying the heist sequence itself. I, I must admit that, though, that when they actually do the heist and you see what the grand master plan is, I mean, you know, it, it works. But I have to admit it's it's a little bit, um, I mean, not not hokey, but it's like <laughs> if this was your grand master plan, um, it's a it's a little bit on the silly side, but you know, I, I suppose with the 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 way that the uh, casino industry was running things in the mid fifties, you know, it, it it's plausible enough. But if you start to really question it, you go, well, I guess this is why you didn't tell us what your plan was before, because it is a little, 
it's a little bit far-fetched, but you know, it 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 it, it works. Uh, so it, it, I'm not trying to sound negative, but uh, it it is. I think of the six films in this set, I, I, I think people will probably say, you know, it's going to be between this and probably Escape in the Fog as what's probably going to be viewed as, quote unquote, the weakest of the six. Um, but, you know, you have to look at, you know, most of these films were just intended to be, be crime thrillers before noir was even an accepted term. So you do have to look at their production origins. And I do think it was, again, very wise to humanize all the characters from the original story because, uh, uh, you know, going by what they discuss in the extras, had they literally made the story as is, nobody would care about any of these people because they are quite um, reprehensible and just not decent people that you want to have anything to do with so again that that was a very wise choice so to talk about the video presentation this is another sony hd master uh, it is largely clean and free from defects you will notice or at least i noticed uh there is a tiny bit of wobble in the credits and there is the occasional uh speck of dirt or things like that that you know that's obviously going to creep in here and there it's nothing really to worry about uh particularly on an older catalog master uh i did also notice there's a tiny bit of uh fluctuation going on in one scene with uh with a boy they're literally on a doing a process shot so it's a background plate uh, which can happen on shots like that and it's probably intrinsic to the original uh, film elements themselves. I also noticed that on several points where there's a dissolve uh, normally you have in a dissolve they have to use you, you know you cut to sort of dupe footage and you have a quality loss then you have the dissolve and then dissolve finishes we're in the next shot or sequence and then after a couple seconds you'll see it sort of like noticeably click in to you know back to the original negative footage well in this transfer uh, there are several dissolves where uh, you start to have that happen, but the actual length is quite long. So you'll have a shot suddenly uh, go a bit soft, like it's going to go into a dissolve, but it holds that for a bit. Then you have the dissolve, and then on the next shot or sequence, that actually holds for quite a bit. So I, I don't know if uh, that, that may, again, just be part of the original uh, negative elements for this film and just how it was done. Uh, but you will notice that there are several dissolve points that are printed really, really long. Uh, so that was that was interesting to note. And again, I don't know if that's just what they had in terms of elements left or um, if that was just how the film was originally put together and it's just baked into the film itself. On the audio side of things, it's once again a PCM mono track. It's largely free of any problems. The two things I did notice are probably going to be, again, uh, actually baked into the original film itself. Uh, there is one scene where it does seem like uh, Kim Novak has a line of dialogue that is a bit muffled and then there's another one where she has a scene and she has a couple lines of dialogue that well really just one or two that sound very muffled and seem like they were dubbed in later on so maybe they uh, changed a line or changed a wording and then it was just dubbed in and it, that's why you obviously have the the quality loss for that one bit so those seem like they're probably, uh, you know, actually baked into the original film's production, uh, which you know, does happen in catalog titles all the time. That's just it is what it is. Uh, the only other thing I noticed is at the very, very end, it does seem like there's a tiny audible pop at the end credits, uh, but uh, that was just a sort of blink and you miss it thing. But outside of those, uh, the the track is is clear of any problems and sounds, you know, as as good as you would expect it to without any uh, major signs of uh, noise reduction application or things like that. So uh, again, those those two lines uh, or, or moments are do seem to be uh, you know actually baked in to, to the original film itself. And we have the beautiful packaging. Again, the artwork just really jumps off this cover, particularly of course the red <laughs> of the title and uh, Kim Novak's dress there. And the spine. Here is the interior with the image from the guys caught up in the first uh, holdup. <laughs> Again, it's not very well planned. The guy literally just walks in and, and, and tries to rob the cashier, and they're in line. And, of course, this being a film noir, immediately they get picked up by the police, too. And, of course, the disc tray has the shot of Kim from the nightclub sequence. The rear has the extras and the—I love how they print the tagline on these— and. You see the little blurb about actually filmed in Reno. 
Now, in terms of the extras, uh, this mentions, again, this is Sony's HD Master with the original mono. Uh, the new audio commentary is by David Jenkins, who goes into great detail about comparing uh, the, the film version of the story to the original Jack Fenny story, which is vital to understand uh, that in the adaption process, they actually managed to address most of those issues then there is a wonderful guardian interview with kim novak done in 1997 where again it's just it's an audience interview where you have uh, a great interviewee and then they do a Q&A session at the end and uh, most of these are always audio only but this one actually has has video footage so you basically get uh, you know 67 minutes with a Kim Novak interview and you actually have video footage it is limited because of course it's 1997 but that was a really nice touch so it's basically an entire feature length extra in addition to the commentary and they do mention this film at least in passing a little bit but of course most of the discussion is is about the most famous works in her career then uh, there's also of course a three stooges short uh, which is 1958 sweet and hot and of course the the tangential collect connection is the boys uh, get with a female singer and try to go to the big city and find fame and fortune so you know as you, you you can see the linkage a little bit and I, again i just love the idea of tucking away three stooges shorts in a noir box set uh, we also get the original trailer, which is in HD, which is really nice to see. Uh, then we get the really extensive image gallery, again, with stills, publicity materials, posters, lobby cards, and even some foreign posters. So, again, uh, Indicator does amazingly well with those. And then we get the Indicator new and improved subtitles, and this is the film's UK premiere on Blu-ray. So, while I don't think Personally, for me, this is as strong as some of the other films in the set. I do find it really fascinating for the particular elements and especially being set in the world of, at least partially in the world of casinos and being a casino heist film, which is always fascinating, even though casino owners probably hate that concept. Uh, it's fascinating that they got actual participation. So I guess they had to submit their heist idea first and get it cleared with the casino so other people wouldn't try to uh, attempt such a maneuver without the casino being prepared for it. Uh, and of course, being very early on in Kim Novak's career and her having a nice sort of standout, even though uh, she is very much the, the token female and in, in with all the other guys. Uh, it's, it's well put together, well directed, well performed. I just Personally, for me, I just don't think it's quite as strong as some of the other films in this set, but I still find it really fascinating. Next is 1957's The Garment Jungle, which is one of those films that's incredibly powerful, but doesn't quite hit the mark. And that is entirely due to the film's production. This is a very, if you, you know, look up, you know, films that were messed up or derailed by having you know issues with their uh, directors being replaced well this is right there on the list because this started out as a columbia picture trying to follow in the wake and the success of on the waterfront but about uh, corruption in the garment district so in the clothing industry in new york and it was directed by robert aldrich that seems like a perfect match with aldrich's very hard-hitting no-nonsense style uh, you know seems like it would have worked perfectly but unfortunately he ran into trouble with columbia and eventually that led to uh essentially harry Cohn having him replaced with vincent sherman who is a good director and is very underrated and i really love some of his classics that he directed at warner brothers but he's not the same kind of director and they did really soften the the film in terms of they started out making a much harder film and there's a lot of that in here but if you see this film and you've or if you've seen it before and you didn't know any of this you might find yourself wondering why there's this sort of push and pull feeling where it's like this film goes really dark and has really scathing moments and moments of real darkness and moments of real very engrossing character introspection and also really hammering home that uh, these these are not just characters but these are people with real lives and real problems and then how do they try to deal with these things and also getting you into the sort of at least some aspects of the everyday lives of the actual workers of the garment districts and the union organizers versus uh, the uh, the various bosses of the firms and then the head of the various uh, crime syndicates that have a stranglehold on the industry. So 
again, there's a lot of the DNA of on the waterfront here, and that's the picture they started out making. But unfortunately, Harry Cohn and Columbia at some point decided, you know, this is just too much, and apparently uh, they, they just pulled the plug and and Sherman came in and was supposed to ostensibly just you know sort of finish off things but wound up redirecting some material apparently so basically enough to where he gets the actual director uh, direction credit and it's noted or, or, or seems that Aldrich decided not to fight it and um, that this whole experience sort of uh, ruined his career upswing for a couple years and so he was kind of left reeling for a little bit um, until you know he later on had greater success with things like whatever happened to baby jane and eventually the dirty dozen with many other classics sprinkled in between but there was this period in the late 50s early 60s where he just was sort of wandering around wound up going to europe for a while and making films like actually a hammer co-production uh, done in germany uh, in 10 seconds to hell so things like that and that's why he got to that point but that makes this film definitely compromise. So it's still a well-made film. It's still very good. And it has moments, I think, of real greatness in it. And it has some really great performances. But all of this is sort of curtailed or held back or derailed a bit by the, the production headaches. So I think, I think it does ultimately hurt the film's effectiveness. So when you get to the end of it, there is a bit of that sort of... It's, it's not a distaste. It's not a, oh, you know, that, that sucked or that was terrible. But it's, it, you do get that sort of sense of uh, it doesn't quite hit the mark fully, you know. It, you know it's obviously not on the waterfront, but, you know, it, it, it try, you have flashes of a movie like on the waterfront in there throughout. And then frequently it, it, it sort of backs away from that. And I think that all comes into play with the, knowing that there was a good portion of the film that was reshot. So... If you thought this was a sort of more modern thing of having directors replaced and the film reshot and it's really different from its original form, if you thought that only happened today or if you thought that only started really with uh, Richard Donner getting fired off of Superman 2, no, there, there are examples that go back further. This is a, a real key one. And again, you I think you could really pick up on this, even if you just come to the film cold, you don't know anything about it. And then Indicator's done a wonderful extras package that really goes into a lot of this. So uh, once again, the, the extras really do enhance your viewing experience of this film. So I would recommend as soon as you finish the film, go right into the extras and listen to the commentary because they are very important to understanding why this film has so many great highs in it. But it, it, it never quite achieves all of that. And originally, it probably would. I don't think it may have been a great film, but I think it would have been a very exceptional film. Uh, but again, you know, I really love Aldrich's style. Uh, and I do love uh, Vincent Sherman's work as well. But they, again, they are not the same type of director. And that's why I think the material really does not mesh. Uh, I think the editors at, at Columbia did a very good job at trying to make them mesh. And you can watch the film as is and go along with it. And it's, it's, it's pretty good. But there are select sequences which seem glaringly, you know, different in tone. And those, you know, that's where you're literally going, okay, this has got to be Aldrich because Sherman would not do something like this. And this is a much darker film because it's very striking. Uh, so to talk a bit about the film's plot, it revolves around the Kerwin Matthews, who returns in this film as the son of the, uh, the sort of lead company uh, owner of uh, the biggest company in the garment district, played by Lee J. Cobb. So there's your direct on the waterfront connection. Um, and he's basically one of the holdouts in terms of uh, not unionizing when uh, the unions are really trying to get a, a foothold in the garment district and achieve better working conditions and pay and rights for all the workers. And Cobb's character has basically had for decades, at, or years by this point, uh, a sort of unwritten agreement with the, the various criminal syndicates and organizations who are run by the headman, played by Richard Boone, who is wonderful as he is in every film he's ever in, uh, to sort of you know, be the one to go in and, and crack heads together and intimidate everyone to keep the unions out. And so uh, Matthews's character is, again, a returning war veteran. So we get another 50s noir playing with, a, you know, a returning GI coming back to uh, 
uh, the, to the country he's been away from, and then really having his face rubbed in uh, all of the sordid underbelly that uh, exists in America. And that's sort of a fun noir trope, I think, around this time period. Uh, but this film, I think, is really made by the character performances, not necessarily the lead performances. Uh, the, 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 I think especially uh, that the real standouts are, of course, Robert Loggia as the uh, the sort of head guy in uh, this chapter of the Union and how he basically dedicates his entire life and being to try and improve working conditions uh, under great risk and stress and basically his life is threatened every day that he does this job and that only builds and increases over time uh his wife is played by the wonderful Gia Scala who is a vision in this film and has such a wonderful quality of an inherent sensuality she's actually introduced uh when the Kerwin Matthews character goes to talk to Logia's character and talk more directly about the union away from the the eye of his father and he goes and finds him where uh, Diascala's character is actually giving dance lessons uh, uh, in order to have some side income because, of course, they're poor working class. And uh, it's just a wonderfully staged sequence. And practically immediately you see the Matthews character become <laughs> uh, hopelessly infatuated. So that becomes a sort of unspoken love triangle, which is handled uh, actually quite well and never goes into cliche territory but this whole sequence I think is where you totally get it you know it's screaming this is somebody else directing this uh, because again it's extraordinarily sensual you get the the actual sense of how hot and sweltering it is in this room because everyone is uh, visibly sweating the entire time and on top of that uh, Logia's character is actually having to watch and take care of their infant child so you have that's not exactly something you see even in noirs all the time. So there is that attention to realism there as well while they're having this important conversation about uh, why the union's so important and they're being shut out and uh, how every every working class person is being screwed over and things like that. Um, so again, I think the film really takes off when it gets to the supporting characters. And for me personally, and I think for all James Bond fans, and even the, the extras they mentioned that uh, it drove him crazy that the one thing he's remembered for is playing Dr. No, there's a really nice part and a supporting role for Joseph Wiseman, who of course we all know from Dr. No, and uh, it's wonderful seeing him get a sort of bigger part, uh, even though it's a supporting role, and, and uh, do some interesting things with uh, what would seemingly be a more one-note character as another of the sort of lieutenants in this chapter of the, of the union organization, and I just, you know, I just get happy every time he's on screen. So it's wonderful getting to see him in something else besides Dr. No, um, which he shouldn't ever have been ashamed of because it is, I think, the best villain performance in the entire Bond series. But uh, it, I, again, I think the film really takes off and uh, and flies most freely when it's dealing with supporting characters and, again, getting more into the, the real-world, gritty, day-to-day -day, uh, struggle of trying to maintain a living in New York, but also under the constant threat of the, uh, of, of the criminal syndicates and organizations. And the film isn't afraid to go dark when it needs to. Uh, there are notable bits of violence. There's actually, they're, they're having a meeting and all of a sudden it gets broken into and uh, they're you know, not only intimidated, but you know, literally beaten almost half to death inside their own meeting house. So uh, the film is not afraid to get nasty and violent when it needs to and everything is done without being gratuitous. But again, you're always having those, tonal, the, those sort of tonal shifts throughout. So again, it, it, that, it never meshes, and it does feel like the film is frequently soft-pedaling a bit. Uh, and I think that that is entirely down to you know, somebody else coming in under studio orders to really soften the film, and they're reworking things, and it's not the same. So I think, again, the most standout moments are the grittier scenes and the darker moments and even the bits of violence with more of the supporting cast. There's another really striking scene where um, the uh, Logius character is on a, on a picket line at night uh, under complete risk of losing his life, of being killed. And 
uh, the Matthews and Scala characters go in basically into a bar where they're just sort of trying to weed out and figure out what happens. But she's got her child with her, and then the child starts crying. So while they're having this really intimate discussion, she literally goes around to the other side of the booth, and so then they're talking at you know cross purposes essentially, which is always a nice dramatic visual. But then she actually starts breastfeeding her child. And that in a 1950s film, you know, you see stuff like that and you're like, that's got to be altering. There's just no way, you know, because when you play the, oh, who shot what game and, you know, you don't have any materials, so you're just guessing. It's like, you know, it, it, of any scene in this film, you know, it's like that's that's got to be from the original Robert Aldrich shoot. I mean, that's just, you know, and and she's just trying to survive and she's completely agonizing over everything that's going on and uh, neither of them are having a great time but then you know that <laughs> that extra little bit to the actual scene that extra little bit of 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 drama and it's so understated you know it, it's it's just again really hammering home what these characters have to do to survive and of course she would have to feed her child and of course uh, the added sort of sadness of doing this at like two o'clock in the morning in a dive bar that just has some old drunk sitting at the bar <laughs> meanwhile she's talking to a guy who's clearly hopelessly in love with her while her husband is potentially about to be murdered at any minute you know um not necessarily good for the nerves <laughs> so I, I, again that's a great example of where this film really excels there's also great moments of character drama there's great uh, moments for lee j cobb to build up a nice sort of internal uh furor and self-loathing and then uh there are some great scenes where the father and son really come to uh heated arguments and really almost come to blows at points so there uh, i still think it is a really excellent film but it's just it's so unfortunate that it it does soft pedal its message it does sort of backtrack in the um in in really depicting the darkness of, of what it was supposed to do this was a film that was supposed to have bite to it you know it, it was really following in the wake of on the waterfront not not that way it would be on the waterfront too with clothes but you know it it very much was in the same vein and that's the picture they made but then basically got cold feet about it, and instead of admitting that, they just basically <laughs> they took it out on Aldrich and uh, sort of derailed his career for a while. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that it turned out this way. I still think it's a fascinating film, chock full of great supporting performances. I mean, all the performances are great, but it, it shines best uh, with the, the attention paid to all the supporting characters. And it does have that good, uh, th that definite bite to it in certain sequences and moments. And if you were to play the sort of guessing game of who shot what, I think you can tell definitely, at least in those standout moments, you know, it does obviously seem like, okay, this, this would fit in an, in an Aldrich picture, you know, um, you know, this, this is the guy who made Vera Cruz, you know, <laughs> so, um, I just think it's unfortunate it had to turn out this way, but I do really uh, highly recommend it still. I think there's so many great elements in it, and it does give you that wonderful feeling of being in New York and having some location footage in there, and it feels intrinsic, so it feels like you are actually there. Um, I would I would actually include it in a list of really great you know New York films, uh, and I think that is a very important quality to have. Again, not as much as on the waterfront, and Aldrich hated that because he wanted to shoot the whole film in New York. He really wanted to push uh, the the meaning behind the story they were trying to tell, and he was having to fight the studio the whole time to get as much of that on the screen as he could. So I think the whole project was, was compromised from the start because apparently Columbia didn't want to make what they were trying to make, if that makes sense. They, they didn't want to go – they didn't want to commit fully, essentially. And unfortunately, that does sort of mar the, the, the final film itself, and you're, you're not going to be able to get away from that. And uh, once again, I think the extras package here is really important for explaining all this, because outside of that, all you really have is a, you know, a, a bit on the Wikipedia page for the film, a bit on its IMDb page, but 
if you actually watch the film, you can really see this stuff and you, you definitely feel it. Uh, so I, I think that is that is the biggest takeaway from this. It's got a lot of great riches in it and it has some really standout moments and some standout performances. But unfortunately, uh, the film is really harmed by its production troubles. Now to talk about the picture, this is another 2K restoration by Sony with participation from the Film Foundation. It looks excellent and again you can definitely tell the difference between uh, the 2k restorations and the pre-existing sony hd masters in this set because of course the the newer work is always going to stand out a bit more and of course higher resolution things like that um in terms of the picture it is of course widescreen 185 to 1 black and white which again i think is always really striking uh i, I do think visually it is quite pleasing and one of the better looking discs in the set again because it's a newer 2k restoration however i will say i did notice two things with this transfer uh, there is just a tiny bit of of wobbling going on in the opening credits but that's probably intrinsic to the source and you're almost always going to see that on any classic film because all of that is in the pre-digital era and is having to be done manually or via optical printing, things like that. Uh, so you will notice just a tad of that. And then also rather strangely, uh, the opening 10 to 15 minutes or so, uh, it does seem to be a bit bright in terms of the actual transfer itself. Uh, I'm not sure that may be just intrinsic to the original photography of the film and it may all just be baked into it, but it did seem like the opening 10, 15 minutes or so are definitely a bit brighter than what you may be accustomed to with black and white films. And it did seem brighter than the rest of the transfer, um, but that may be just, again, something baked into the source or uh but it just it just seemed a bit noticeable that that uh, the sort of opening reel was a bit bright and in, in the transfer itself now on the audio side of things it's once again lossless pcm mono it sounds quite excellent throughout uh, no major issues that i noticed however i will say that in the again in the sort of opening uh, 10, 15 minutes, so I guess the first reel or so, it did seem like there was an odd sort of low frequency uh, thump effect that was going on. So if you have a subwoofer turned on in your home theater and you just always have it on, uh, it, it, it's probably going to pick this up. It's not very loud. It's, it's very faint. So at first I thought it might be hearing things, uh, but there does seem to be just a very light sort of very low uh, occasional little uh, uh, thumping noise sound effect again in the first reel or so. So um, most people might not actually even notice it or hear it because it is very indistinct. And if you have you know smaller bookshelf speakers, you're probably not going to hear it. But uh, if you have bigger uh, tower speakers like I do, it, you, you will notice something like that. Uh, again, that could just be inherent to the original audio source they were using. It could be inherent to the film itself. I'm not entirely sure. But uh, it does clear up, and it is just so minor, I, I thought I was just hearing things at first. Here we have the original poster art, which is very much hyping up the sex angle of the film, which doesn't really <laughs> exist in the film. So they were definitely trying to sell this a certain way. It's beautifully printed on here, and again, I, I just am always amazed at how good these look from Indicator. There's the spine. The interior has the shot from the meeting I mentioned in the film where they are literally broken into by a whole gang of miscreants who start by threatening, then they pull out weapons, and then they literally beat the absolute crap out of everyone, which is a really striking sequence. Then the disc label has the same art as the tray. And here's the rear with the probably the best tagline in the set. Uh, you know, throws the acid right back in the gangsters' faces. Um, that seemed to be written about the original Aldrich version, I would say. <laughs> I know I keep harping on about that, but it's it is very key uh, to understand about this film. So we go into the extras. Sony, uh, Sony and the Film Foundation's 2K restoration with the original mono track. Uh, Kevin Lyons does the new audio commentary for this release, which is, again, essential for uh, understanding further about the film's production and getting into the sort of nitty-gritty of what happened and why it went this way, in addition to talking about the various cast and crew and giving some great biographical information. So of the uh, tracks in this set, I think it is one of the best commentary tracks of all six films in the set. 
Then there's an entire 20-minute interview with Robert Loggia, uh, which was done by Alan K. Rohde, for the Film Noir Foundation after they screened The Garment Jungle. And it's a wonderful interview. He talks about his whole career, and he does talk uh, a, a bit about this film and its production and uh, un- how it unfortunately didn't go very well for his career, even though it's a standout performance. And he does talk about at least what he remembers about uh, the director switching and everything and how it did hurt the film itself. Uh, so it's it's a wonderful interview. Uh, it's only 20 minutes, but you know, you feel like it it covers so much ground, and he's so um, you know incredibly open and and uh, wonderful about recounting all kinds of stories and anecdotes from his entire career uh, and sort of his career relaunch in the 1980s. That um, you wish it was longer. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, then we get a 15 minute piece called Law of the Jungle, where Tony Raines talks about. The big elephant in the room. He talks about Robert Aldrich. He talks about Vincent Sherman. He talks about the whole production hassle this film went through and how it was ultimately, uh, you know, really harmed by this and how it was originally a much darker and better film. Then The Boys Return for uh, Rip Soon Stitch, which is a 1953 Stooges short where. The boys are tailors and get uh, caught up with criminals. So, of course, that's how it connects. And again, I. It's such a wonderfully wacky idea, and it's beautiful seeing these shorts on Blu-ray. Um, again, hopefully Sony is going to uh, do a Stooges Blu-ray set simply for uh, getting these restorations in HD, but um, it's wonderful seeing them here, and I just love the sort of wonderful, goofy palette cleanser after watching a, a really dark noir. Then we get the original trailer, and again, another very extensive indicator image gallery with stills, lobby cards, posters, foreign posters and all kinds of production material Uh, again new and improved english subtitles by indicator and this is the film's uk premiere on blu-ray definitely this this i think has the most important extras in terms of any films in this set uh, simply because this had the most production problems and they really need to be explained so you can better appreciate the the wonderful strengths of this film even though it is definitely a unfortunately a, a compromised film in the release version and then we come to 1958's the lineup directed by the legendary don siegel this is a really interesting film because of course it's based on a television series of the same name which was very popular in the 50s and of course itself was based on the original radio show of the same name so this is where you go from radio to television to film And the whole film project was supposed to be cashing in on the success of the television series, which, of course, had to deal with the extreme television censoring of the golden age of television. So when you come to this film, it starts, you know, it definitely starts with a bang because it's Don Siegel. The whole pre-title into the main title sequence has great energy to it and everything. But then, the, you know, it turns into essentially a uh, it's a full on police procedural and it does feel like sort of an expanded TV show with a budget type feel. And Don Siegel himself actually directed episodes of the lineup television show. He did the actual pilot episode. So it makes sense that he's the person sort of tapped to direct the film adaptation. And so you would be you, you, you would be right in thinking when you come to this film for the first time that after the extreme energetic opening of the film that it sort of settles down into being a police procedural and it, you know it's it's rather dry and we have the two cops going around trying to gather information about this uh, this incident that occurred where a cop was killed and uh, by by a runaway driver who also was killed and then essentially it's discovered that he was what would now be termed a drug runner and had picked up some contraband that was filled or you know picked up an item from uh, from a transit location that has actually filled with drugs and was trying to make a getaway. And this puts them on to the case of this drug ring that's operating in San Francisco. Uh, the, the Really, San Francisco is the main co-star of this film. This is one of the great San Francisco films. And this is, in a lot of ways, it's Don Siegel sort of doing a lot of stuff he would do in Dirty Harry famously in 1971. So if you ever wondered, you know, what what came before that, this is Don Siegel in San Francisco going to town with real practical locations in the late 1950s. And 
it's fascinating seeing things that you recognize from other films. Uh, there's even a shot where they are at the same hotel in the same year that uh, Jimmy Stewart winds up watching uh, and observing Kim Novak uh, coming in and out of in Vertigo. So uh, there's tons of little illusions like that that you could uh, that you can that your brain is going to make, and you can't help but uh, in the film's uh, finale there is a car chase through San Francisco, and it definitely seems like the precursor to the bullet car chase the whole film seems in some ways like a precursor to bullet um you know not not quite with the same uh, stylistic approach as bullet has but you can see this as a sort of foundation for both bullet and dirty harry and for that alone and being one of the great san francisco films this film deserves to be seen and remembered however well, the film really gets going when the procedural section stops. So basically that's the part where, okay, this is for the people who want the TV show and are coming to this because they like the TV show at home. We can get this all out of the way in like 20 minutes. And then when the primary antagonists arrive, they literally come in on a plane. And as soon as they touch down in San Francisco, that's when the film really starts. And we are introduced to our pair of, you know, essentially point men, hit men uh, for the uh, for the drug syndicate, and they have to uh, participate in this system where there are no names exchanged, but they are essentially pointed out to which people uh, coming off of planes or ships are the unwitting drug mules, and they have to get the items from them uh, that have been passed through customs. They have to get the items back and then actually, you know, remove the drugs and then get them to the drop point by a certain point in the day. And so then it basically becomes a sort of travelogue through San Francisco as they're going around. And uh, they, they don't just take these things. Like, you would think they would just try to secretly get them out, uh, but they basically wind up also killing all of these people. And the most striking element is... The, uh, the 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 more vicious of the pair is played by Eli Wallach, who, as the character of Dancer, is, you know, he barely is able to repress his psychopathic tendencies and is a just, you can't take your eyes off him, as, as in every film Wallach was ever in. He is the lifeblood of this film, uh, and, you know, alongside Mickey Rooney's performance in uh, Drive a Crooked Road, you know, this is the acting standout of the entire set. Uh, it's one of the great performances in noir in terms of, uh, it's one of the great screen villain performances, and being a great fan of Eli Wallach, you can't help but see the little flashes of even his uh, Tuco performance in this character. Um, but it's it's wonderful what he does with it and how he tries to maintain a sort of civil front, uh, you know, when he's when he's walking around. But when he gets going and when the when the sort of bloodlust comes up and it gets in his eyes and you just know that every person in in that city block is going to be obliterated and they are uh also fascinatingly you know he's frequently using a silenced pistol which is a very you know, it's it's a notable thing for a 50s film because you're not seeing that all the time but there is a a, a great degree of sort of uh, malicious glee in in the in the killing sequences. Uh, nothing is ever gratuitous, but it, it it's Don Siegel, so it's got that that bite to it. The action has a grounded realism, but it has that wonderful intensity. Uh, and the whole film, uh, once once it really starts with uh, with our <laughs> with our villainous heroes uh, of the piece, once they get there, that's when the film really starts. And it builds over the course of this time period where they're basically going on a rampage <laughs> through San Francisco, and then the police have to deal with all these bodies that keep turning up, and they're able to start putting two and two together that this must be, you know, they're they're sort of going along the line and getting extracting the drugs from the unwitting mules and then killing them too so that's why they've got a, a citywide pile of bodies uh but things of course build to a head at the end of the day and the last case doesn't go so well <laughs> and they have to get to the final drop point so you're interestingly sort of shifted onto the side of the criminals and it seems like that's what the whole film was about and if don siegel and everybody else involved could have done away with the procedural sort of opening 20 minutes they would have but they kind of had to do that because that's what people expected because that's what the tv show was like so it's an interesting film in in that regard and you know don't don't be put off if if you don't like how dry and basic the opening stretch section is 
but there's so much to discuss about this film. There's so many fascinating elements, and you get the full time capsule experience of being in late 50s San Francisco, right down to the fact that part of the climactic car chase actually deals with the freeway they're building with the big, massive sort of cloverleaf ramps and things. Uh, and they go all over the city with the, you know, in full broad daylight using real practical locations. Uh, again, San Francisco really is the co-star. This is one of the key San Francisco films. Uh, you know, any list of, you know, the five or 10 best films set are using the city, the lineup is in there. And if you ever wondered what 50s San Francisco was like, just watch this film. It's like you were literally there. Um, just And of course, it's widescreen black and white, which always, I think, enhances, uh, for some reason, it, it enhances the, 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 the vividness and almost enhances the reality of what's being depicted, even though it's black and white. I think it just heightens the drama to such a point that, um, you know, it manages to make you sort of feel you are there even more uh, than it uh, would have had it been shot in color. So uh, this is a film I would not spoil for anyone. It is a, again, it's Don Siegel, so you know you're in for a really wonderful, dramatic, and thrilling time. But the uh, Eli Wallach, it just eats up the screen. He just, <laughs> he does, he devours the screen in this film. Um, it, 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 this, this is a must-see noir title, even though it's at the very end of the sort of period coming out in the same year as Touch of Evil. Uh, but it has all the darkness of noir. It has the, the fun action of being an action thriller and the wonderful time capsule of being, a feel of being in 50 San Francisco. And it is totally a precursor to both Bullet and Dirty Harry. Uh, if you're a fan of both of those films, as you should be, uh, if you've not seen this film, it's basically Don Siegel getting to do bits of Dirty Harry, you know, a, a, a way before in the late 50s. So it, it is uh, of the six films in this set. I think all of them are worth your time and they're all great in their own ways. I really love uh, a good number of them, but the lineup is definitely the the, 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 the real standout and is probably going to be the one that you may have actually heard something, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, have some knowledge of uh, before coming into this set of these six titles. This is the most notable one. Um, this is the one Sony has put out on DVD before with some extras and things because it is one of the really notable titles from the sort of last days of the uh, what's considered the classical period of noir which is generally, you know, referred to basically 1940-41 up to about 1958 with Touch of Evil. So this is like right there at the very end of the classic period. Now, the picture transfer for the video quality, this is an older Sony HD master. I think it's the same one they struck for uh, the DVD box set a number of years ago. Uh, it looks quite good. Uh, you will see some occasional specs and things here and there, but nothing very intrusive. So again, it's pretty much what you expect from a really good Sony HD catalog master from years past. Uh, there is a tiny bit of uh, frame wobble in the opening Columbia logo, which again is pretty common for HD masters of this era for most catalog titles and of course there's also a little bit of wobble on the credits which again you know you when you start watching a lot of classic catalog films particularly on you know again non 2k 4k modern scans and remasters uh, and restorations you you should expect there's at least going to be a little bit of frame movement or something going on uh, when you have the logos and the credits, uh, both uh, opening and end credits. So that's to be expected. But outside of that, it's a really handsome transfer, uh, and you're only going to notice a stray bit of uh, you know a spec here uh, here and there very infrequently. But it looks excellent, and of course is a widescreen 185 to one black and white. Now, the audio is, again, mono PCM, no issues to report here, no signs of major damage or a large amounts of distortion or anything. Uh, so it sounds very healthy, but I've only seen this film on DVD before, and it does seem to be the same master, so uh, I, I don't have any uh, prior releases to compare it to. Now, the packaging, again, beautiful usage of the original poster art. Uh, Eli Wallach is used as the key figure and, of course, is the key figure represented on the box itself. There's the spine. Of course, it makes sense that Wallach is also the star of all the interior art, from the photo choice to the disc label, and of course, the disc tray art as well. Then here's the rear. 
with the original blurb, of course, hyping that this was based on the television series. Now to go into the substantial extras, uh, which some of these do date back to Sony's old DVD. Uh, this is Sony's HD Master with the original mono track. Uh, there are two commentaries. One was done for the Sony release, which is the track with uh, with James Elroy and Eddie Muller. Now this track does uh, does um, really stick with a, a lot of people who who listen to it. Um, if you've never heard uh, James Elroy in like you know panel discussions or on commentary tracks and things, um, you know his his um, his novels are quite dark and they are filled with with uh, you know violence and murder and all the troops of noir, but uh, you know very very highly stylized and in your face and they are classics for a good reason. But when he um, when he does talks or things, it does seem like. At least to me, it does seem like he's sort of playing a, 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 a sort of character and he is sort of, you know, hyping things up a bit and saying things for sort of shock value. And so when you listen to this commentary, that's like 90 percent of it. <laughs> you have Eddie Muller on the other side kind of just getting very uncomfortable, like, uh, are you serious about this? I, I don't know if I would do that. Um, So it's you know in, on one hand it is entertaining uh for for most of it but you know it's it's frequently you know Elroy kind of going off the deep end and i i'm not sure i think he's sort of trying to sort of have fun with with people and sort of mess around with people a bit i think that's what he's doing and what he's going for uh, at least i hope it would be uh but yeah it's it's not it's not going to be the most enjoyable listen for people, and I know there are some people who heard this track and then you know swore off ever hearing him on a commentary track ever again because there are other tracks where he kind of does the same thing again with Eddie Muller kind of just being very uncomfortable. So, um, yeah, it's I, I want to preface that for people who haven't heard it because um, I listened to it on the DVD before, so I knew what I was in for, but I had forgotten just sort of how off the rails he kind of goes. But again, I I think it's just sort of his shtick and i think he's not and not serious about the stuff he's going on about at least i certainly hope he wouldn't be um but yeah that's that's something you should know or be aware of if you've not heard this or uh if you've not heard a commentary track where he participates before or heard him talk or something basically just go on youtube and just look up uh, james elroy and you know try to find like a panel or a convention or a q a or something and you'll you'll probably find a soundbite and kind of get the idea of, of what i'm trying to explain here but uh, do be forewarned you know don't don't um don't have this in the house just playing in the background when 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 the whole family's around because uh, then they will be um yeah they'll they'll just uh, look at you very strangely uh then the other commentary track is a new one for this release which is done by david delval and c courtney joiner uh this is also a, a great listen this is much more your traditional you know actual factual commentary track but also with great personal insights because you know they know the city and they know the film and they love the film and it's a it's a warm conversational commentary that still goes over great amounts of detail so if you were to just listen to one of these commentaries it should be this one instead of the older track uh i guess the older track is just for those who are um a, a bit more adventurous or or, or 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 okay with listening to a wilder commentary track uh but i am very glad they commissioned a new one because this track with joiner and uh, del val is a very good listen so again if you were only to listen to one of the tracks it should be uh their newer track which is exclusive to the indicator release then we get the other extras uh, the 2009 piece Influence of Noir, which is where they have basically Christopher Nolan being a sort of talking head, and this was done uh, for the Noir box set, so there are some clips of the other Sony titles from that set, so that dates back to it. Um, he talks a little bit about this film and, uh, you know, again, its purported influence on his work and so on and so forth, so... You know, it's basically when they just get a big name of the time to, you know, at least lend some notoriety to this release so they can get these titles out and hopefully make some money to then work on further titles. So, you know, it's good to see when, when people do that. And he does, you know, talk positively about the films, which is great. But, you know, it's just one of those sort of talking head pieces. Uh, then there is a really well done uh seven minute video essay which is called the streets of san francisco of course wonderful title um 
But this is a beautiful photo essay uh, doing then and now comparisons of the locations used and mentioning when they're used in other films and the connections to Vertigo and Bullet and Siegel's other work. Uh, this is really well done with very wonderful uh, quality photographs, and it's just one that you, you could just sit there, you can just pause and just soak in the images and then do the, the um, you know, let it play and go to the then and now comparisons. It's one of the best ones I've ever seen uh, of doing this. It sounds like a simple concept, but it's actually, I think, very difficult to pull off and make enjoyable. And uh, it also is not rushed, so you're able to recognize in your head where that was in the film you just watched. Um, it even highlights, <laughs> I, I have this thing, if, if I see a film and the, there's a theater marquee and you can clearly read what's playing, I, I, I can't help it. I have to pause or go back later and see what was playing. And they actually highlighted it, um, you know, because I literally paused it when I was watching the film because it was so clear and I couldn't help it. And then I'm like, oh, they've got a fair to remember. Okay. And then they actually highlight that in the film and talk about the actual um, theater itself which i i was so happy to see in the uh locations guide so it's only seven minutes but it's one of the best extras in the entire set in terms of being really expertly done then they nicely include three episodes of the radio series itself so you can do a direct comparison uh these are from different episodes in the run and of course like most radio series i don't think the complete show survives um i had never actually seen uh the television show or heard the radio series but um i've now listened to these and of course being a bit of a radio geek i, I kind of want to check out some of the more uh, some of the other episodes at least and uh, at least uh, don siegel's pilot and some of the episodes of the tv show i guess uh, but it's a nice inclusion because of course the radio series was completely different to the television series and uh, it does you know have great importance here because without the radio show neither the tv show <laughs> or the movie would exist interestingly some of these were actually written by blake edwards and one was written by blake edwards with Richard Richard Quine. So there's your linkage to Drive a Crooked Road right there. Uh, then we once again get the boys uh, in the short Tricky Dicks, which is their take on a police procedural. So there's a beautiful linkage and, you know, gives you a nice bit of levity after watching this really hard hitting film. Uh, and of course, wonderful to see it on blu-ray so again hoping sony does the uh, uh, stooges uh, blu-ray set we also got the josh olsen uh, trailers from hell commentary piece which are always fun uh, another wonderful image gallery loaded with stills lobby cards poster materials and really well done uh, new and improved English subtitles by Indicator, and this is the UK premiere on Blu-ray, and I think the definitive disc release to date of this classic that should be really uh, seen and discussed and revisited many times. Don't let the opening sort of reel of police procedural dry slowness throw you off because uh, once once that's out of the way uh, the ball really starts rolling and you know when when you see this film you you might finish it and think. I now have this strange desire to write down the last words of people who have died. <laughs> like the, like uh, e. Wallach's uh, character's partner in this film, played by Robert Keith, uh, and uh, their, their wonderful sort of interplay. Uh, I forgot to mention this before. I don't, I don't know if it might have been in the back of Tom Mankiewicz's mind, but uh, he, you do get that sort of wonderful Winton Kid flavor in their sort of dynamic, <laughs> especially in, in, um, in, in his partner's sort of... Uh, wonderful charm and and uh, he has a, a wonderful uh, sense of style and he's always dressed in a suit and he has this penchant for uh, writing down and taking notes of what is the last thing somebody said as they died because he wants to use it in his um, in, in his writings and in poetry and so and so forth so it's it's a very morbid thing but it's just a wonderful little grace note to the relationship that uh, really is is a highlight of this film then we come to the exclusive book of the box set and I say book because this is not a booklet by any means indicator does the best book and booklets in the business all of their booklets in their limited standard releases are themselves at book quality but the sets always have wonderful hard case type very sturdy books that have lovely wraparound imagery this is of course from the undercover man each film gets its time to shine with essays and vintage materials, interviews, publicity pieces. Uh, so the mix of new and old, I think, is always really helpful to see how the film was put together, what the initial response was, 
and see the the modern interpretation from a great critic or having who has a, a certain insight on each film. So again, each title gets its time to shine. So each film gets new and vintage essays, interviews, and pieces, and it is loaded with wonderful stills. The printing is excellent. The text is very easy to read. They change up the color all the time to keep it interesting to the eye. These are beautifully designed. Again, no one else in physical media does uh, books and booklets to this level of quality. So this is always a major draw of getting the um, getting the box sets. It is a reason enough alone, I would say, that uh, you should look at the box sets even if you're not into you know the exclusive packaging and things. Um, also, interestingly, they even have essays and pieces on the Stooges shorts and the other vintage extras material and materials. So the the Boudicca edited World War II footage uh, has a write up on it. The uh, screen snapshots piece with Mickey Rooney has a write up on it. Um, most labels don't do that. You know, <laughs> they don't have uh, actual pieces on some of the extras. And then you have the presentations and technical page, as always, at the end. So this, you know, it, it clocks in at about 120 pages, which is the average for one of these. So you could publish this as a standalone and, you know, actually sell this at like a Barnes & Noble. And, you know, nobody would blink an eye because this is so well done. It is a standalone, beautiful book product. Let me come to the hard case box itself, which again has Eli Wallach as dancer from the lineup. It has the class, or I guess is now the classic indicator uh, band, or some people call it the belly band, or so on and so forth. So this slips off, of course, and you have the box itself. It's this wonderful hard case that really protects the contents, looks beautiful. The printing and artwork is excellently done. It's a beautiful display piece that still fits on your shelf, and it's concise. It does its job perfectly and it looks wonderful and again it's also very protective the discs slot in on the side they are all the digi packs so you do always want to be careful with these you do want to be careful sliding them in and out because it is easy to catch the corners a little bit but um i, I it, it also allows them to make the boxes a little bit slimmer and have a nicer premium sort of feel for the films in their individual little um, digi pack cases so these these are wonderful. Um, you know, once once you get one of these that is designed like this, you sort of get what they're going for. And uh, I just I love getting one of these, and it's you know definitely something that is going to hold up to a lot of pulling on and off the shelf over the years because this is the type of set you return to time and time again. Again, all of these titles are now sold as standard editions, so this is the out of print set. All the disc contents are the same. Uh, but you do lose all of this wonderful exclusive packaging, and it's not even very expensive when it's brand new at list price. So I do think the overall value is excellent for these, and I highly recommend any of Indicator's limited uh, box set packages when they are available, and especially the noir sets that are still around. Uh, please uh, do yourself a favor and get a copy of them before they're all gone, but unfortunately uh, now this and the first couple volumes are out of print. Now, the band itself, again, has in their traditional style, has all the titles on the front and side. The right side always has some vintage piece, so they've used the, the bit from, <laughs> wonderfully chosen, the bit from the Garment Jungle, so you can proudly put this on your shelf, and this will be sticking out, and people go, what? <laughs> I want to see what this box is. And then the back with the images, and this is numbered. So this is pretty late in the run. So this is, you know, 5097 out of 6,000, which is usually about uh, the number they've gone with on all of the noir boxes. So those are my thoughts on Indicator's wonderful release of Columbia Noir Volume 1. Unfortunately, it is now out of print, but thankfully all the titles are still available in these wonderful disc presentations as standard editions on Indicator's website. So while you can't get the wonderful box and exclusive book and the lovely packaging anymore, you can still get these films in what I think are easily their best presentations available anywhere in the world uh, on Indicator's website as standard editions. So 
if you do miss out on these boxes, which I've missed out on a couple of other series they've done, uh, you can still get, thankfully, the same wonderful disc. You just lose all the wonderful fancy extras uh, exclusive to the limited boxes. So once again, I do highly recommend any box that they do. If you're interested in any of the titles, I do very, I want to stress, it is a much better idea to purchase them sooner rather than later because they do sell out. And then once they do sell out, you regret it immensely. Uh, I missed out on the first Hammer box they did, unfortunately. So I have all the others and adore them, but I still wish I had the first one. But I was able to get the standard edition. So, you know, it doesn't look as good on the shelf and makes your collector OCD just start screaming at you. But at least you're able to still get the same wonderful disc releases, which, of course, is the most important thing. Now, I do really think that Indicator once again uh, surpassed themselves with this series, uh, even though they've moved on to doing Universal Noir titles. It's unknown if they're going to do a Columbia Noir Volume 6. All of these have their attention to quality and detail, even if not all the films have brand new 2K and 4K restorations. So I do really think I, I, I place this in my sort of Blu-ray Hall of Fame. I do think it, it qualifies as being one of the finest releases on the format, which is the same way I felt about their uh, fifth volume in this series, uh, the Bogart set of the Columbia Noir series. And... I figured since it was November, it was a perfect time to dive into doing uh, some of these box sets as video reviews. So I will be making my way through uh, volumes two through four as well as soon as time permits. And uh, even if, unfortunately, still won't be in November anymore. But uh, I, I, I think this whole series across the board, as with pretty much everything Indicator's ever done, really belongs in that select uh, top tier uh, you know, Blu-ray Legends category, if you will. I guess that's what I would call it. Um, again, not every film is a brand new restoration or master, but the uh, beautiful encoding jobs, the attention to detail, the extras, they, they really strive to do uh, as, as good as humanly possible. And it's always the degree at which they, they, uh, the, the, they, they do this, the links that they go to to really try and make a, a seemingly archival presentation of a film with historical context and background and the best technical quality available from the best source and master they can get from the owning studio or licensor uh, is, I think, unmatched. So that's why I do think that this this entire series, but you know this this volume as well, uh, you know, for Colombian Noir, uh, the series that Indicator did, uh, I I think it is among the best Blu-rays ever made. Um, without question no i don't think any other label goes to these links and that's that's what's most appreciated and you get one of these sets in your hands and you just before you even take the plastic off you just feel that quality commitment emanating from the box so uh, it's not just because i'm a gigantic fan of this label but i am a gigantic fan of this label because of how impressive their releases are and the quality and the care to getting things right just emanates from the actual package you just have it in your hands and you can tell this is from people who actually care about films as much as you do uh, and that is priceless so that's why they're my favorite label that's why i've done now another one of my super long video reviews about another of their beautiful box sets and if you have not picked up any titles in the columbia noir series i strongly recommend it they are some of the best uh, noir releases that have ever been done on physical media in terms of the overall package and production uh, even if you missed out on the box sets the standard editions are still excellent and still worth your time and the best presentations of any of these these films to date on any format. So I hope this has been at least somewhat fun and informative to once again hear me babble on about classic films and film noir and uh, physical media and the, the wonders of the indicator label. And as always, I like to say keep supporting boutique labels and studio labels by buying discs and supporting physical media to help keep it alive. And thanks ever so much for watching.